I want to talk for the next little while about a whip, a towel, and a cross. What I hope to say is predicated on passages from the Synoptic and the Johannine Gospels. A whip, a towel, and a cross. Some souls are permitted to stare death in the face. To some, not to all, but some is given the opportunity of viewing the approach of their own demise. Jesus belonged to that number. He knew the time and the place of his departure. Near journey's end, he led the twelve up to Jerusalem for Israel's Passover feast, knowing beyond the slightest shadow of a doubt that his pilgrimage would soon be over. After ministry, brief in duration, but long in significance, he came to the city of his sorrow. After sealing the waters of a treacherous and tempestuous sea, he came to that place where he would open the floodgates so that the water of life might flow freely to all the children of man. After three years of revealing the inadequacy and the irrelevancy of that religion entrusted to his own people, he came now to open a fountain of grace where the reprobate sons of Adam, Jew and Gentile, bond and free, might drink freely for the redemption of their souls. With dauntless determination and with absolute assurance, he came to Jerusalem. He came to face death squarely and to yield to death's cold, clammy embrace. What does one think about with just one week to live? When the end is clearly visible and not only visible, but ineluctable, what thoughts enter one's mind? When one has entered the dead end street, as it were, and there's no turning around, what occurs in the deep places of the heart? All of us know that somewhere along this journey called life we will be relieved of our marchings. We know that perhaps at some eventide taps will sound as the final benediction to our pilgrimage. But what happens, I ask, in the thought processes of one when the end is clearly in view and the bugler can be seen getting ready to blow. I suspect that then one is one's most serious self. If not, one 
certainly should be if foolishness and frivolity are ever out of order they ought to be when one sees the unrelenting advance of death for at that time like no other time one is most keenly aware of one's mortality any illusion you might have about your own greatness in that hour goes down like the evening sun and any thoughts you entertain concerning your mastery of your own destiny fade away suddenly like the grass for in that hour you are helpless and totally impotent to stretch out the cords of your own existence in that hour you know without fail that there is something beyond yourself that is calling a halt to your earthly march you can silence it but you can't stop it you have not the power to even postpone it. And one ought certainly be serious at a time like that. Uh, you ought to be settling your accounts. You ought to be rightening your wrongs. You ought to be forgiving and beseeching forgiveness. Uh, when one sees the approach of death. One ought to be busy repairing broken fences and straightening out crooked places. I speak, of course, of those like us, those who have been tainted by the unsavory forces of sin those who have been weighed in the balances and found wanting those who from the miserable pit of sinful bondage have had to cry out from time to time lord have mercy i do not speak of the son of the most high who knew no sin there were no crooks or crinkles in the cloth of his character that needed to be ironed out. There was no limp in his walk, no stammering in his speech, no blur in his vision. He did not have to get ready to die. And yet he had to die. He had to face death squarely and yield to death's embrace. He did not have to become serious about life. He came to the world with seriousness of purpose. Uh, from early on, he had been sober and altogether serious about the issues of life and death and ultimate reality but even with Jesus those last days reveal a depth of concern and a height of seriousness which we cannot afford to ignore for near the end with suffering and death clearly in view he, act, he acted in ways which reflected his high regard and abiding love for all who seek to follow him. In life, we tend to judge others uh, mainly by the things they give up and the things they put down. I have listened uh, from time to time during this Lenten season uh, to the remarks of people who have given up certain things for Lent. Right 
the subways, or walk the streets, and uh, you'll hear people talking about things that they've either given up or put down. Uh, there is a negative kind of morality abroad which tends to greed people, uh, not on the basis of what they do, uh, but on the basis of what they do not do. Uh, not on what they accept, but on what they refuse. Not by what they pick up, but by what they put down. Now Jesus always made a plea for a positive morality. Uh, where the key word was not don't, but do. Uh, it hath been said of old, thou shalt not. But I say unto you, thou shalt. And during his last week in the earth, uh, he did some picking up which had eternal relevancy for the believer and for the Christian church. He picked up three things which dramatize the depths of sin and the magnitude of God's love. Uh, he picked up three things which uh, point up in graphic manner uh, the awful gap, uh, the terrible chasm between wretched humanity and blessed divinity. He picked up three things which portray in bold relief the sinner that I am and the Savior that God is. All right, all right. On Monday, he picked up a whip. On Thursday, he picked up a towel. And on Friday, he picked up a cross. A whip, a towel, and the cross. On the day following his glorious, triumphant entry into Jerusalem, amid uh, the hosannas of a palm-waving crowd, Jesus visited the temple. Uh, when he entered uh, the sacred precincts thereof, he immediately was confronted with the corruption of Jewish religion. The money changers were there. They were busy with their high and exorbitant interest rates. The sacrifice salesmen were going about their business, selling pigeons to the people. And people in mass were using the temple as a common thoroughfare. The house of God had degenerated to a place of ordinary commerce and had lost its sanctity. What did Jesus do in the face of this awful misuse? of God's house. Uh, did he stand on the porch and give a lecture on the sanctity of the temple? Uh, did he gently chide them by saying, you shouldn't do this, it's not nice? Uh, did he ask them to please refrain from what they were doing? No, he did none of these. My Lord picked up a whip and drove those men out of the temple. And as they scrambled with coins rolling everywhere, they heard Jesus say, Is it not written, My house shall be called the house of prayer? but you've made it a den of thieves. That's the King James rendering 
Uh, the Phillips translation is more pointed. Don't you dare turn my father's house into a market. Jesus picked up a whip and he used it. Now I know that this runs counter to the thoughts uh, we usually have of the Christ. The world doesn't really like this kind of Jesus. The world likes a sweet, soft, sentimental Jesus. Sweet little Jesus boy who was nice to everybody and troubled nobody. Uh, this is the kind of Jesus who's regularly paraded before people at uh, ladies' luncheons and social teas. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of Christians uh, run past this scene. They, they don't like to see their Lord angry. Uh, Jesus doesn't lose his temper. The Son of God doesn't lose his cool. Uh, but I submit to you that Jesus was as much the Son of God when he picked up the whip as he was when he picked up a little child and said, Suffer little children to come unto me. He didn't lose his temper. He didn't lose his cool. He was as godlike then as that day when he whipped angry waves and boisterous winds into a tranquil calm by simply saying, Peace, be still. He was as much like God when he entered the temple as when he filled the stomachs of 5,000 men plus the women and the children. For that whip represented the sovereignty of God and his mastery over all things. That whip represented the power of God Almighty and it was a wrathful act signifying divine displeasure. You see, God employs whatever the situation demands. When a whip is needed, God uses a whip. And a whip was needed on that Monday. Whenever life is profaned, a whip is needed. Uh, you see, there are times when words are not enough. Uh, there are times when one must cease to talk and begin to act. God's house deserves the deepest respect and the loftiest reverence. For there is a special sanctity about this place. There's something peculiar about holy ground and people ought to be careful how they act when on holy ground. What works out yonder in some other situation is not necessarily suitable for the Lord's house. A behavior that's perfectly legal outside may not be acceptable inside. The dirt people get away with in the world cannot be permitted in the Lord's house. That's why he picked up a whip and when he finished using it, he passed it on to his church that God's house might never become a den of thieves. Jesus said in essence, you do not prostitute religion. Uh, you don't make a racket of religion. You don't commercialize the faith. On Monday, he was the great upsetter. He stormed the temple and he picked up a whip. As the week moved on and as death's approach came nearer, uh, the mystery of the master's life began to unfold more and more. Uh, like a huge scroll being unrolled, uh, his purpose and mission became increasingly clearer. Uh, the closer he came to the waiting arms of death, uh, the more we understand just how much God loved the world. For on Thursday, 
as the master presided over a meeting of his disciples outside the city limits where they spent their evenings. Uh, he sent two of them into the city uh, to secure by a prearranged signal an upper room. Uh, and when that man bearing uh, a water pot of water was approached, uh, he immediately led them to an upper room. And on that Thursday, as evening approached and uh, as the day began to fold herself in the thick mantles of darkness, uh, Jesus of Nazareth and twelve itinerant preachers made their way uh, down from Mount of Olives through the Kidron Valley and on up to the holy city. And they walked through uh, the cobblestone street to an upper room on a back street. And there in the intimacy of that setting, the master of life transformed Israel's Passover into the church's Lord's Supper. Uh, with godly perspective and divine candor, he outlined the perils they would face upon his departure. Uh, he did not play Pollyanna with them. He told them point blank, in the world ye shall have tribulation. With divine compassion and uh, a kind of heavenly tenderness, he calmed the rough seas which uh, overflowed the banks of their restless souls by telling them, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Uh, with prophetic insight and a knowledge of all things, he looked across the years of the church militant's existence and prayed that they all might be one. And then in that upper room, at the table of sorrow, while John was weeping and while Peter was boasting and while Judas was plotting and while the others were simply listening, Jesus, the anointed one, uh, the word made flesh, uh, he who from eternity sat at the Father's right hand, he who was the ancient of days, the Father's only begotten Son, he by whose word the word were free. Jesus. Jesus got up from the table, picked up a towel, and proceeded to wash his disciples' dirty feet. On Thursday, he picked up a towel. Oh, this too is somewhat alien to the modern mind. We don't like a God who picks up a whip, and we don't like a God who picks up a towel. Picking up a towel to wash men's feet is a sign of inherent weakness. Uh, God is a strong God. Uh, one of his names is El Shaddai, God Almighty. Uh, he's omnipotent and omnipresent and omniscient. Uh, men don't look down on God. Men look up to God. Uh, the ancient Hebrews saw him high and lifted up. Uh, he's great above all gods, infinite, immeasurable, uh, incomprehensible. He's exalted above everything. You look up to God. But the record tells us he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel. Jesus, the God man and the man God picked up a towel. He who was the host behaved like a slave. The disciples just a little while ago uh, 
had been arguing about places of prominence uh, in the coming kingdom. Uh, they were concerned about exalted favor and position and rank and privilege. They didn't have time to wash the feet of Jesus. But Jesus, without saying a word, picked up a towel, got down on his knees, and bathed their dirty feet. God on his knees. God doing dirty work. God with a towel in his hands, staring at grimy feet and dirty toenails. God down on his knees, washing feet. The disciples are grumbling and jostling for power and anxious to be big shots. While Jesus is down on his knees showing them what the love of God is all about. And he tells them, if you want to see greatness, if you want to know what God is really like, look at me. If you want to be great, serve. If you want to rank, be humble. If you want to go up, go down. Put on the apron of humility and serve others with gladness. Pick up a towel, get out on your knees and serve somebody. Concern yourselves with the needs of others. Then your own needs will be served. The way to the solution of your own problems is to lose yourself in the problems of others. Pick up a towel in God's name and use it for somebody else. On Thursday, in that second story setting, amid the noisy chatter of men clamoring for status, Jesus picked up a towel. Well, Thursday is about over now. The supper is ended. They descend the narrow staircase and walk out into the Jerusalem night. The warmth of the upper room is now behind them. There's a chill in the atmosphere. There is treachery in the air. They cross the brook of Kidron and enter Gethsemane where the master prays with Peter, James, and John close by. But they fail to watch with him. They fall asleep. The end is much closer now. He's praying about a cup neath the boughs of trees in Gethsemane. He talks with his father about a bitter cup. Uh, he, he'd like for God to remove it. Father, if it be possible, remove this bitter cup from me. Uh, but his divinity declares, not my will, but thine be done. Treachery is terribly close by now. It's in the shadows. It's even in the evening breeze. He's betrayed and given the kiss of death by one of his own. He's carried away to be tried by both religionists and politicians. He's declared guilty of treason by an unregenerate mob. He does not answer their charges, for he knows that his record is written on high and in the hearts of men. He doesn't fight back, for he hath already said, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world. He knows the truth 
is not determined necessarily by popular vote or by opinion polls. He doesn't even become vindictive. He simply says, before Pontius Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. The unthinking crowd stirred up by proud Pharisees, blind Sadducees, and corrupt religious leaders cries out, crucify him, give us Barabbas, and crucify Jesus. Pilate gives sentence that the Galilean must die. And on that Friday, amid the snares of an ungrateful multitude and beneath the brilliance of the noonday sun, with disciples out of sight and friends all gone, Jesus picked up a cross. A whip on Monday, a towel on Thursday, and now a cross on Friday. He picked it up. Be sure to understand that he picked it up. It was done of his will and of the Father's will. He picked it up. Had he not declared, no man taketh my life, I lay it down. He picked it up. Had he desired, he could have called up heaven for 10,000 legions to fight his battle. He picked up the cross. His suffering was voluntary and at the same time compulsory. He was compelled by the sins of men and the love of God. You see, there's something in man which gives meaning to the cross and there's something in God which necessitates the cross. He died for us. The just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous, the one altogether lovely for the unlovely. He loved us with an everlasting love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. See him pick up that old rugged cross. See him trudging through the streets of Jerusalem. See him treading the wine press alone. See him climbing the hill and thinking as he climbs, thinking about you and thinking about me. See him going up, going up to die, that I one day might go up to live. Look at him. Out yonder on Skull Hill, where criminals have breathed their last and said their final farewells. Look at him, being bruised for our iniquities and wounded for our transgressions. Listen, as the centurion says, surely this was the Son of God. Uh, he was not marked by ordinariness there was something divine about him, surely. He was, he is, he will always be the son of God. The flowers breathe it, the winds blow it, the clouds shadow it. He is the son of God. The sun shines it, the moon beams it, the thunder rolls it. He is the son of God. The lightning flashes it, the oceans roar it, the skies spread it. He is the Son of God, the angels sing it, the redeemed believe it, you know it and I declare it, He is, He is, He is the Son of God. That's why we sing at the cross, yeah. at the cross, yeah. where I first saw the light yeah. and the burden yeah. of my heart yeah. rolled away. Yeah. It was there yeah. by faith yes, I 
received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. On Monday, he picked up a whip symbolizing his sovereignty. On Thursday, he picked up a towel symbolizing his servanthood. And on Friday, he picked up a cross symbolizing his saviorhood. A whip on Monday, a towel on Thursday, a cross on Friday. With his whip, he corrects us. With his towel, he serves us. With his cross, he saves us. And the thing that I love about him is that ever since, he's been picking people up. He picked me up one day. How about you? Yes! I was sinking deep in sin, but he picked me up. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Doors of the church are open.